Morning all. The Gibraltar tournament's just finished, and um, I covered some games with Nigel Shaw, but also uh, Britain's Michael Adams was playing, and he did very well in the tournament. And one of the very interesting games of Michael Adams I'd like to show you, again, Sean Elvest played in round nine. Uh, and I think it demonstrates um, a theory which I've been thinking about uh, recently. Um, there's a lot of uh, videos about the docking computer concept, which is basically uh, examining, examining forcing moves, even if they're outrageous. But I think there are two kind of ways of supercharging that concept of forcing moves, which which could be uh, very useful to consider. Um, the first concept is, is already uh, an established concept on this channel as well, weakness of the last move. Uh, so I'd like to put that together with Docking Pure, and I'd also like to put in a third concept, uh, basically um, not needing a plan, just going from the moment. So uh, putting less value on a longer term plan, and more on just the current position, how you can improve the current position even subtly, if that's possible, using forcing moves and the weakness of the last move. So those are the three concepts which I think this game really illustrates actually in dramatic fashion. I think put together it's a very destructive combination. Uh, so let's see if I can convince you of this. e4 from Michael Adams. Jean Elvis plays e5. Uh, we see knight f3, knight c6 quite so far. It looks like Steinitz defense with d6 here. So black's securing the e5 pawn. Uh, we see d4, and now off the bishop d7, black is, is accepting a slightly passive position from the opening. We see knight c3, different from standard Roy Lopez stuff, with the knight blocking the c-pawn. e takes d4, knight takes d4, and now black plays g6. So this bishop is not going to be entirely passive, it would seem to be quite active on this diagonal, spending an extra move uh, fin chattering it, slightly weakening some dark squares though in the process uh, potentially, especially if this dark square bishop is exchanged off at some point. So we see castles bishop g7 and now uh, Michael Adams he takes on c6 which is giving up the bishop pair and you might think also isn't it giving black a little bit of dynamic play potentially along this b file but we've seen in many games of uh, Michael Adams, sometimes he's very successful some, from such positions where it seems as though there's some potential in terms of a dynamic looking pawn structure from the opponent. But somehow he manages sometimes to obliterate it. Uh, so although there's some dynamic potential, it will take some moves for black to exert real pressure. And uh, you know, what about say a move like uh, B3 later? Well, then the diagonal might also be exerting an influence. So it, it looks a little bit tricky, as though this combination of the diagonal pressure and the b-file pressure uh, might be a concern for white later. But nevertheless, knight square bishop giving up to in incur uh, structural damage. So we see rook e1 here. Now, okay, it is defending the pawn, and you might think, what is actually the point of rook e1? Well, we see after the next move, knight e7, the point is more revealed that after bishop f4, it looks as though white might be threatening e5. Here, the rook and the bishop support the thrust e5, a strategic break in the position. What would that give white, this strategic break? Well, it might help exchange off dark square bishops in one case. Uh, in another case, it might get the c5 square. If black ever plays d5, we might try and capture that c5 square. So it's an interesting idea. And the black slightly you know, was concerned about this, perhaps, this e5. He plays a forcing move c5. The knight goes back. And again, he's concerned about e5 here. Look at everything pointing at e5. So black plays this move, which is quite understandable. And you might think is logically justified as well. Black, black is no mug. Black is a 2605 player. So stronger than most of us on YouTube by far, by a long shot. 2605, very experienced grandmaster, Chan Alvist. He plays f6. So he judges here, uh, perhaps, you know, with white without the light square bishop. Why would this diagonal be, you know, fatal uh, in any way? 
can't black simply hold up against e5 by doing this and this is very interesting okay so it looks as though this is you could you could label this prophylaxis against e5 prophylaxis against the strategic break uh, maybe a prelude of counterplay removal maybe g5 later making an excuse out of this bishop to play knight g6 to e5 that would hem in that bishop though maybe maybe uh, more to the point might be later securing e5 in some other way for example bishop c6 uh, and then f5 uh, would get would create pressure perhaps so you might think there's some dynamic uh, play in black's position we see now a very interesting move this bishop doesn't look too great does it and so this next move queen d2 is surely not about exchanging off this bad bishop but what do we know about bad bishops we label them bad bishops, for example, in the French defence. But bad bishops often add an element of solidity to one's position. And when there isn't solidity, then I think the capability for forcing combinations actually increases. So therefore, if you do exchange off an apparently bad bishop, you might be looking forward to uh, combinations based on a reduction in solidity. So let's see here, after black castles, in fact, Mickey does play bishop h6. So queen d2 wasn't just a pretty centralizing move to, to follow up with rook d1. It has a functional purpose to get rid of this apparently bad bishop. Now, why would white be interested in doing this? Because um, e5 looks totally out of the question, doesn't it? Black now plays a5. And this might imply, for example, a4 and rook b8 using this b file using this dynamism of the b file and in fact okay uh mickey might might have been concerned about bishop g4s here he plays this move h3 and it seems as though nothing much is going on isn't black um, potentially doing well on this b file he's going to celebrate this b file or not we see a4 as though yes that 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 pool is supported uh there ready to undermine white's structure if, if b3 is ever played after rook b8 or queen b8 maybe so hasn't black got sufficient counterplay so we see rook ad1 and it starts to be apparent here that actually hold on a sec the solidity of black's position is a little bit under question because what if the forcing move takes and then e5 is played we've got a loose piece on d7 in this position uh, you know d takes we'd have queen takes d7 f takes we'd have knight takes because if we remove that first so already it seems as though bishop takes g7 is, is a useful uh, option to have here and black seemingly he plays this next move which would seem to address this this major issue this e5 issue bishop e6 uh, so the bishop is surely not loose on e6 here black is surely holding up e5 you would think well okay now <laughs> this is where I'd like to revisit what I what I said at the start of the video this idea of combining three different things uh, a kind of weakness of the last move combined with forcing moves combined with this uh, kind of minimalistic approach of not going for a long distance plan but rather playing from the current position in order to even get a slight subtle increase in advantage that would do as the plan and you know sometimes they say if you haven't got a plan you can find a default plan like improving your worst piece you know something subtle just to improve your position so within the, the broader context of positional play you you might um, argue Therefore, that if you have forcing moves which exploit the weakness of the last move, which aim to subtly increase uh, some subtle advantage in your position or weaken the opponent subtly, then that's also positional play. It's not in the realms of tactics. Or rather, you could say it's tactics in the context of positional play. But here we have a scenario where it doesn't seem as though this is a weakness of the last move, bishop e6. Does it? Does it create a weakness of the last move? Well, let's let's try and um, exacerbate that issue with forcing moves because forcing moves provide independence. It doesn't matter if you're playing Garry Kasparov or a computer. If you're playing forcing moves, you're you're giving the opponent 
uh, no options. So com try and combine the two concepts, weakness of the last move with forcing moves, with this notion that you, you haven't got any long distance plan. Why is not uh, thinking about neutralizing the B file, uh, playing for F4, F5 with knight H2. This this would be like long distance plans. Uh, White is not trying to uh, necessarily win an end game, engineering some some other exchanges. Um, White is now playing from the position here. And okay, what is this kind of weakness of the last move? Okay, we see here. Uh, Bishop takes g7, so black has no options. Black has to take. Okay, and now guess white's next move. If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, white plays e5 anyway. So what on earth is this about? Well, the weakness of the last move here is that this is still a loose piece, actually, potentially, on e6. Now, why we wouldn't regard it as a weakness of the last move? Because it doesn't seem to be a loose piece which was able to be at all exploited. But loose pieces are often the basis of tactical combinations. Um, so what is actually happening here as well on this default? This rook ad1 is pointing at the queen as well. So you might consider it's not just the loose piece, it's this queen frontal attack possibilities. If this pawn wasn't there, this rook would be threatening this queen as well. And we'll do a second pass of this game uh, to, to examine different possibilities. But here d takes e5 was rejected in favor of f takes e5. And now we see another uh, forcing move, which is surprising. We see knight takes e5. And all of a sudden, actually, these loose pieces are feeling some cold winds coming their way. Uh, for example, if d takes e5, we see that the weakness of the last move in terms of bishop e6 and the queen on the default is, is, is showing up now, a, a simple way of showing it up. And it might not be the most exact. Is is for example queen e3, where the rook is now attacking the queen, and the bishop's coming next on on the slaughter. Uh, for example, queen moves check. How many options for black? Rook f6. Let's say knight e4, and it starts to look quite dangerous here. It looks as though both of these pieces are, are really loose pieces in black's position and this might not even be the most accurate. So we'll check in the second pass but that wasn't uh, played here. It was trying to be ignored with queen c8 so not exposing the queen uh, on the d file. Uh, but now we see knight g4 and okay this this loose piece means bishop g4 is, is out of the question surely because a rook takes e7. There's also the threat of queen h6. So Black does seem to be in a little bit of bother here. And okay, we'll, we'll check this in the second pass. In this position, Black played knight g8, seemingly trying to cover up the h6 square. And now we see knight e4, which introduces uh, various possibilities, uh, most notably queen c3 check, which will be questioning Black's king safety. And in fact, in this position, Black felt his position was lost. Black resigned. This was a 20 move game. Black resigned. And that's why I thought this is a really dramatic example of a kind of subtle weakness of the last move in combination with, you know, picked on with forcing moves. And this attitude of playing from the moment, you know, sometimes it said you've got to have a plan. I'm just wondering, you know, Often you can work forwards from the current position you have and work from the heat of the moment, or rather the, the weakness of the last move of the moment. It seemed to work out very well here. What did White actually do in terms of a long range plan, if we're being honest? White was content to slightly improve or slightly weaken 
the opponent's position, making use of forcing moves and the weakness of the last move, surely. Now you might wonder, there is some debate on chess games column about this end of game position. Why did Black actually resign? Uh, because, let's go with this now. Bishop takes g4, check. And initially, you know, I, I, I needed to check this as well because Black has a resource here, King h6. So is it entirely clear that Black is actually being obliterated? Where is the proof? Well, the proof actually, after h takes g4, uh, there's menacing threat. So we'll take this pawn. It starts to be very dangerous in uh, this position. There's a very accurate move here needed. Um, so not rook e3, you just blunder the rook. But rather, okay, I hope you can spot it. I've given you a clue. You want to try and get to the black king. So what would you play in this position if I give you 10 seconds starting from now? Okay, rook d3. This is a good attacking move to play rook h3. So black hasn't got too many defences. The king's cut off from, from retreating back. So let's imagine rook f5 to be able to parry rook h3 with rook h5. Okay, now the technical, uh, well, engine move here is uh, rook g3 actually instead of rook h3. Okay, to kick the queen and then now play rook h3. So we see rook h5 in this position. Rook takes h5. Okay, now if king takes, I believe, queen g7. Uh, now let's let's just add a bit uh, at this point. It seems to be uh, very dangerous. If king takes, I believe, or, or even stronger than queen g7 is queen h3. And this this is winning. The forcing moves win here. G4 check, winning the queen. So that'll be the end of the game. Just take the queen. Um, so that will be the end of the game there. And, and on g takes, which is basically the only move, black's position looks pretty uncomfortable. But there's a knockout blow here in in the form of knight takes c5. Uh, this uh, this affords a rookie six check, uh, and it basically is is carnage. For example, takes check king here check. The king's brought up the board, and we can win the queen. So, okay, may, maybe you might consider that Black's um, resignation at knight e4 was um, a, li a little bit on 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 the fast side. Why, why did he resign immediately? Instead of playing this through, Bishop G4 is is apparently uh, the strongest move. If if G5 check, this diagonal is really quite painful. Another forcing move here. Knight takes D6, attacking the Queen. Rook takes. Uh, rook E8. Okay. And okay, there's there's various technical moves here, like Rook C6 and Rook E5. Uh, but it looks as though uh, this this is big trouble for Black. If taking this knight e5 check, so let's let's move the queen somewhere, and then we could just take on e6. Black's overloaded basically. So if black takes here, there's a knight e5 check. So yeah, the the end of the game does require a lot of explanation. Um, what why black resigned? Uh, let, let's have a look uh, at this game from the start. So it looks as though white had technically an advantage. And I just, I just found it incredible, really, how uh, you know a seemingly odd idea of exchanging off what is a bad bishop actually reduces significantly the solidity of Black's position. And um, White's really working for e5 anyway, just ignoring the fact that Black seems to have, you know, made efforts against e5. But White's working for e5 anyway because now he's like. You know, putting the rook against the queen, and this this one casual move, bishop a6, bishop e6, which seems to be quite logical to take away this this e5 problem here, is is an, represents an obliterable uh, position. I I just find that quite surprising. I don't know about you guys that this position here can be obliterated with a combination of you know basically looking at a slight weaknesses of the last move, forcing moves. Uh, and just being content, you know, to slightly weaken uh, the opponent's position. If we look at various alternatives, what could have could have happened here? D takes e5. Um, still has has these two as potential victims. These are slightly loose pieces. So we see queen e3 attacking the queen. 
Uh, say the queen moves. Queen takes c5, attacking the knight. So say the knight moves. Then look, this is a victim here. Knight takes e5. It's a loose piece victim to forcing moves. So it it does show up like as as though there was a subtle weakness in the last move, exposed with the forcing moves, and why not engaging in kind of an abstract uh, planning exercise, really, of planning several moves ahead for anything else, but looking at the heat of the moment of the position, the weakness of the last move, and just blasting black from it. And of I mean, this is the way engines play as well. They're not like forming a plan and then working backwards from the plan. This is working forwards from the current position. Forward uh, reasoning, forward chain reasoning. Uh, from from the current position, it's based in absolute solidity of the position, uh, the details of the position. So knight takes e5, black again is obliterated. This is just highly unpleasant. Let's see, rook f6, we have this knight e4, so that tries to defend um, Let's try and defend resourcefully the bishop here. Okay, now in this position, um, maybe knight takes f6 is, is a big advantage as well. Um, let's go with queen c3, which apparently is even stronger. Takes queen c5. I mean, what does queen c5 actually even threaten? Okay, queen e7 check. So there's big problems for black. You might wonder, well, what, what if, for example, the bishop moves here? Is, is it so terrible? Rook e7. Rook e6. Rook c7. Okay, apparently white's, white's doing quite well here. Plus two. Uh, he has got a lot of pawns now. But he's got three pawns for that. As well as uh, rook versus knight and bishop is not normally that brilliant, but it's an extra three pawns as well. And there's a big pawn majority coming up on the queen side here. So if we go with b4, uh, it's not that pleasant for black. So it just, it's just, uh, I just found it amazing uh, that uh, working from the current position here, and uh, it's all is not what it actually visually seems, is the usual case. Uh, for a sequence of forcing moves, but directed specifically at weakness of the last move, uh, it just shows how obliteration is just uh, much closer by than one could possibly imagine, actually, of a seemingly good position. Uh, I don't know what you guys think of this. Um, and I found it interesting, actually, that of all the Adams games, I, I just put one word, crushing, and the whole page of comments appeared after that. And, I mean, and there, weren't that, there, weren't, there wasn't that many comments on, on other Adams games. So I, I think it was a more dramatic example of, uh, of uh, a sharp victory. Uh, so I hope you got something from that. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.